Hello, everyone. Welcome to PayPod. I'm your host, Jacob Hollibaugh. And today on the show, we are going to be discussing automating your financial systems, how you could relieve your financial team of some of that manual payments burden and simplify the complexity that can come at times and overwhelm at times those teams. Essentially, how to tame payments chaos, which is a tagline so good that I cannot possibly take credit for it, as I did, in fact, lift that straight from today's guest, who I am very pleased to be joined by. I've got Tal Kirschenbaum, co-founder and CEO at Ledge with me, the company automating your financial operations on a mission to solve payments at scale. Tal, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks for having me. Great to be on. Yes, and thank you for letting me steal that incredible tagline. It's one of the best I've seen, so absolutely love that and had to weave it in there. Before we dive into Ledge itself, let's do a little walk down memory lane, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little background on kind of how you came to be in the payment space originally and what drew you to working within this world? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm I'm a finance person, but also a geek, so I've always kind of walked the line between those two different paths. Um, started out, you know, in terms of my my educational background, so studied accounting and economics in undergrad, and then went on to get an MBA from University of Chicago, where I also specialize in finance and in terms of my professional career. So always have been straddling that line between, again, finance and tech. I actually started out my career in corporate venture capital with Intel Capital, which is Intel's in-house corporate venture capital arm then did some strategy consulting for the Boston Consulting Group, spent some time with Facebook doing uh, mergers and acquisition for them in their Menlo Park campuses as part of the corporate development team, and, and then transitioned actually very deep into the payment space. I, I got to spend uh, a few years with a accounts payable, accounts receivable automation solution company called Melio, which is a, a bill.com competitor, uh, absolutely fantastic company, uh, one way to think of it is essentially like Venmo for for SMBs for small businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very familiar with them around these parts. Although I don't think we've had anyone from Melio on to talk, so I'll have to make a note about that to potentially mm -hmm. bring someone from there on to the show. So then. Coming up on, I believe, two years ago now, or just shy of two years ago now, if I've got my dates correct, you leave Melio to co-found Ledge. And as your website says, you and your co-founder, Asaf, have felt the pain of payments before. I liked seeing that, and that leads me to the kind of obvious question I ask a lot of founders, which is, what was it that you either experienced that pain that you did experience or what was it you saw missing in the market that you know wanted you wanted to dramatically improve upon that led to the idea in the ultimately the creation of ledge yeah absolutely so i have to say that that's primarily thanks to my time at at milio which uh, as as a payments company deals with a pretty complex and fragmented infrastructure spanning across its ERP system, its internal database, the banks that it works with, the different payment processors that support some of its payment flows as well. And what Milio had to do simply to serve its customer as well as to operate as a business, which is to, to know what really happened with its payments in the narrow sense and finances in the broader sense, is to try and pull together and bring together all those disparate siloed data sources. Now, Emilio, as a payments company, is, is quite savvy when it comes to payments. So it was able to invest quite heavily into developing a sort of an internal layer that does exactly that which is bring in all those uh, separate data sources together and make sense of what really happened with its payments and, uh, again, business in the broadest sense. While Milio, though, had the benefit of being able to solve that challenge with its internal engineering resources, the problem is one that is not unique to payments companies. It is actually an unbelievably common one. So many companies will share that same type of an infrastructure of a of a stack really if you will mm -hmm. uh, that the finance team has to to struggle with which is to say they have of course one or multiple different bank accounts and that's especially true in a world kind of a in, in post svb going into stewardship world um and of course the same goes for payment processors which many companies use more than one of course you know companies have to also deal with the data that they themselves generate and at the end of the day also make sure that their 
books are aligned with what really happened. And so they face this exact same challenge that Melio faced. But unlike Melio, they simply do not have the internal know-how and capabilities to build a sort of a of an engine internally that's able to sort out the mess that having this very fragmented stack can cause. Mm -hmm. So then that brings us to, can you give kind of the overview of how Ledge, what the kind of current product offerings are and how you go about solving that pain point for these companies then? Absolutely. So at the end of the day, what we do is we help finance and payments teams really audit their day-to-day -day processes, their most common ones. And, and this is true. I think across a variety of things. So from cash flow reporting and providing visibility into current cash positions, as well as projected cash flow into the future to reconciliation, ledgering, exception handling, as well as reporting. And so we're able to do all of that by actually plugging in and connecting, integrating with the company's entire finance and data related infrastructure those same data sources that I've mentioned before, which if you think about it, it's it's really anywhere that houses any transaction level data. We pull all that data in and we uh, make sense of it all. We, we match it, we reconcile it, and we build additional capabilities on top of this understanding of what actually happened with the company's finances. Mm -hmm. And the thing with within the broader fintech world and certainly within what you do within it it's it is a crowded market these days that is you know one of the most common things that comes up on this show is you know just how far this industry and how far the relationship between tech and finance has come in the last decade especially even going back further than that and it it is a really crowded market and so i do always like to ask you know how do you go about setting yourself apart from other similar solutions because there are similar solutions out there whether they're trying to do the entire scope of what you do or little parts of it how do you guys kind of go about setting yourself apart what do you think really differentiates you from anyone else doing either a part of or trying to do all of what you guys do yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a great question. So really, you know, at the core of it is we view ourselves as being unbelievably finance sick, which is to say we view finance leaders and finance teams as not just the ultimate beneficiaries of a solution like ours, but actually as the primary and often the sole stakeholder that we work with. And that's a that's a guiding principle of ours. And so what that means is that we have three, call it product pillars that we, we, we live by and we build our product, which are independence, ease of use, and then of course, something that actually needs to get the job done. So being able to, to be effective. And that's, that's a pretty um, important distinction across all those three pillars. Because if you think about, if you think about independence, for example, what that means is that the product needs to be built in a way that it can just be used day to day by finance teams but also implemented and configured by them and by them alone without having to have finance teams rely heavily on R&D for implementation, configuration, and then ongoing use. And that's a pretty major distinction between uh, how we tend to approach this same problem area to, to some other solutions in the market. Now, when you think of the, the, the second pillar, ease of use, what that means is that we need to have the, the finance team be able to get up and running really in a matter of hours or days. And that's instead of months and, and even years as uh, some finance oriented uh, solutions can be such as ERP systems and very kind of heavy old school treasury management solutions can be as well. And, and that also means that the user experience needs to actually be something that's that's pretty unique, I think, for finance teams, especially with B2B solutions, and that is it needs to be delightful. So it needs to be as close to a consumer-like experience as can be. And that is so that they can actually get the, the, the most out of the platform, the system, and be able to uh, use it uh, repeatedly as part of their day-to-day -day workflows and processes. And, and lastly, of course, the product also needs to deliver against what finance teams need. And that is essentially an accurate, robust, scalable solution that is able to help them automate their day-to-day -day tasks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, 
I mean, obviously, yeah, the last one is the most important because everything <laughs> it does come down to does it actually work? Does it actually do the job and do do what you purport it to do? But I love that you have those first two pillars because it is something that uh, has come up on the show before and that I have a lot of thought about sometimes after these shows and after learning about different solutions and things of thinking to myself, you know, that does really sound great. But if I was in the role that had to, you know, in the company that's bringing in a solution, I would be a little nervous that they came and dropped off a bag of tools and a tool set that I have no idea how to use and that it's going to, you know, it's going to cause more pain in the timeline of me learning how to use these things than, you know, than it's ever going to be able to come back to me on the benefit side of things. So I love hearing the approach of the, you know, this needs to be able to come in and they can do anything they want with it. It is theirs, but they also can learn how to use that tool set very quickly and get to the benefits very, very quickly versus like, you know, basically we'll We'll re-educate you and redo everything you do for a year or so, and then it'll all work for you. But no, coming in and being able to make that quick and give them that autonomy. So love hearing that. You mentioned, yeah, I, you know, I, I oh, have to yeah. say that 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 unique thing is actually, uh, or, or that thing I think is is not unique just to, to finance teams or unique in the payment space, but I think it's an even greater issue and problem uh, with, with actually both of those domains. And again, if you look at many of the, the kind of traditional legacy solutions, that's exactly how they are. And so that's why I think for us, it was especially important to try and, and deliver a sort of an experience and capability, which is one that, that, to be frank, all of us as consumers, as users, would expect, not even want, but expect to get nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned, I think you used the word cumbersome at one point, but you know, you mentioned, you know, this tech stack gets a little out of control uh, for, for different finance departments and different types of companies. And it's been a few months back now, um, but you had shared and expanded on this LinkedIn blog post that I found really interesting and wanted to ask you about. The original post was from Wooter Born with the headline, the traditional CFO tech stack is broken, manual and Excel addicted. And I've got <laughs> two questions about this. You had some thoughts on, you know, why that came to be true and how we could fix it. Obviously, Ledge being a part of this new generation of solutions that could tackle this problem. What do you think, though, were kind of the main factors that led to finance departments falling behind in the first place as far as technological innovation? Was this just the way that it had to be, that they were always going to kind of be last in line to put together all of the tech innovation that came in different departments and different parts of the commercial world? Or was there was there a version if we went back that they wouldn't have fallen behind? What are your kind of thoughts on why, how we ended up in the first place with this tech stack so broken and in need of solutions like yours? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, I think another great question. I, I, I think a lot of it is an unfortunately somewhat unavoidable due to simply the nature of the profession. And so if you think about it, you know, finance people uh, are trained to be conservative and careful in what they do. Oftentimes you'll find that teams have this, um, I'd say, really uh, tendency to ensure that you, first of all, do no harm. That is the mentality, and that is one of the, the primary uh, operating assumptions that you need to follow. But I think aside from that, there's also simply inertia is an unbelievably strong force, I think, in, in life in general. And I think it's especially true in, in, in a business setting and especially true, again, for, for finance teams. You have a certain way of doing things for decades, and it's quite difficult to then bring about an active change into that. And I think this is a lot of what we've seen. And when you combine that with the fact that older legacy solutions had very extended ramp, ramp up periods, both in terms of implementation and then in terms of simply learning how to use these solutions, then of course teams are pretty apprehensive about adopting newer tech Again, we, we spoke about the fact that ERPs and, and treasury management systems uh, often have an implementation cycle of, of 12 plus months. And so obviously, I think finance teams would be a bit concerned about adopting any new technology, just given that they're all probably wearing some, uh, some battle scars still. Mm -hmm. and, and last point, maybe, I think that historically, many of the solutions that were actually... Uh, focused on on helping finance teams do their job were ones that lacked 
independence. So lacked um, the ability that finance teams had to independently both implement, configure, and use those solutions. Oftentimes they would have to rely on other functions, be it product, engineering, data, BI, it really is quite, quite broad. And whenever you have to rely on, on anyone outside of the team, then obviously you've got those dependencies, you, you see timelines extended, and it's it's just a reality of life. And so I think those reasons collectively were a, a major fact in contributing to finance teams really being left behind or overlooked perhaps uh, for, for quite some time, although we've of course seen significant advancements across many other areas during yeah. that same time. Certainly. And I, I think all those are spot on. And the inertia point is super key of, you know, we use the word entrenched a lot within the world mm -hmm. of finances. It's it's the industry that's been around literally forever, essentially. And a lot of the major players are and a lot of the major systems are so entrenched that it takes a lot to get, you know, to overcome the inertia of that big entrenched behemoth that's sitting there getting anything to change, getting anything started, even rolling down the hill towards progress and innovation can be uh, quite the undertaking to do. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask about from in referral to that blog post is it did use the term Excel addicted and uh, <laughs> a similar sentiment. Actually, this, this topic, it, it's kind of random and nerdy to my heart. I came of age in uh, the the time when Excel was kind of having its absolute heyday around the, you know, the early 2010s uh, around that time period when I was in college. I still I wasn't in the finance department, but I was in the business school. And I remember my now wife, uh, you know, competing in the Excel contests that were like <laughs> a big deal in our business school. Like it was like a proud thing to not just be one of the best students in the finance or accounting department, but like, no, I won or like I went to regionals. There was like, you know, tournaments for Excel. There still are. Um, so I kind of came of it's, age. It's actually an eSport of sorts now. There's, yeah, uh, there's which is a, wild. a, a there... global Excel championship, which is uh, streamed live with, you know, many viewers. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, th I think people like you and I can definitely geek out on that, although some may, may find it weird, but I'm, I'm definitely in that camp. Yeah. And so, you know, those people are, I've watched a little of it and they're well beyond any of what my, uh, you know, <laughs> the, my compadres were doing back in the day. They've, they've taken it a long way, but as much as that is going on and I think we'll, we'll stay cause it's its own kind of niche sport thing now, but you know, Excel has went from the most powerful thing in the world of finance and accounting to because we've started to catch up in the world of bringing tech innovation to this industry. Excel is slowly but surely no longer like the one tool that can can hopefully do what you needed to do. What do you think Excel's legacy is going to end up being? And do you think it you know, softwares like it, um, other tools similar to it have a place still in this new generation? Or do you just think that, you know, that's kind of, that's last generation technology and we've we've moved beyond the world of Excel? Yeah, I, I think, and I, I love the term that he used as well, you know, Excel addicted. I think that Excel has been the tool that can do everything and that people have used to do everything. And I think we'll see a lot of that fade over time as we actually see more specialized, purposely designed tools mm -hmm. take additional functions and tasks uh, and are able to handle them much, much better in a more efficient way. Uh, but I do think that Excel or perhaps tools like it will probably still have well, some some space left to them. And I think, you know, at, at the very least, we will probably see things like highly detailed and nuanced modeling, which I think Excel excels at or shines at. I'm sorry, I had to make that pun. <laughs> um, so I think we'll continue to see people use Excel to, to do so just because it, it really is a fantastic tool for that specific type of task. I think that if you look at various types of analyses, profitability analysis for a product, you know, you can easily see someone at a strategic finance function in a, in a large corporation uh, continue to use Excel for the majority of, of, uh, of their day-to-day -day work. So absolutely, I think we'll continue to see Excel and, and other spreadsheet-like uh, tools continue to be used, but I think we'll start seeing uh, pieces be carved out over time. Yeah, certainly. And uh, now 
Final couple of things I want to ask you about some kind of recent news items and other trend related questions in the industry. The first of which is uh, pretty recent news for you and your team there at Ledge. I did see you got to ring the bell at NASDAQ and uh, made a pretty prominent top 50 list recently. And so one, what was that experience like as someone, uh, a day trader at different times of my life and, mm-hmm. you know, very invested in this industry, ringing the bell at NASDAQ seems like it'd be a really cool thing to do. Did it live up to it? But then also I've always kind of wondered with, you know, the different top top lists that you can make out there, things like that, how much does something like that actually, you know, drive impact or, you know, drive, drive anything that's going on behind the scenes, as far as either validating for you internally that, you know, we're on the right path. We're doing, we're getting acknowledged by someone that what we're doing is right. Does it help in the, you know, the marketing kind of angles, things like that. What was that experience kind of like, and what does an experience like that kind of mean for a company like ledge? Absolutely. So, you know, I think personally thinking about the experience, you kind of walk past the, uh, the the visitor center that NASDAQ has. Um, and while you're kind of getting ready to, to, to go into the studio, they still have actually uh, a CNBC squawk box uh, being, uh, being uh, uh, taped or rather uh, record um, uh, shared filmed, live yeah, yeah. Uh, w- w- filmed exactly within, within that same studio. So that's obviously pretty cool. And then they, they kind of flip it over very quickly over the course of about 15 minutes. And while you're waiting outside, you see photos of previous, uh, you know, notable IPOs, such as you'll see the, the, the Microsoft one with Bill Gates and the Amazon one with, with Jeff Bezos, of course, uh, uh, kind of ringing the bell. So it's, it's a very, very cool experience. And, and obviously I think the, Required caveat here is that current market conditions are such that there are not that many proper uh, IPOs. That Nasdaq actually has the ability to to invite uh, uh, various types of companies to to both uh, uh, market open and market close ceremony. But it was still a very cool experience and 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 definitely a memorable day. And in terms of of what it means to to the company in a, in a broader sense, and of course it's it's always great to 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 see and get any external validation to to what we do and to the vision really that we're trying to to bring about of of really just helping finance and payments teams um significantly i think disrupt and adapt to what's available to them today and of course it has some marketing related benefits and we have seen a a a quite a nice uptick in terms of inbound traffic as well but i think at the end of the day you know we're trying to stay pretty focused on on what it is that that we're building and doing and mostly on on the feedback that we get from the companies that we work with that for us uh, has and and needs to remain the key, the, the the key thing that's fantastic yeah and i think a good good thing to stay focused on but still relish in that it was a super cool experience and glad to hear it, that it lived up to what i would expect from the outside that it would be <laughs> that really really cool experience now, one of the things obviously Ledge sets out to do is not just relieve finance teams of the burden of manual payments reconciliation, but help them have the tools to, as we've been discussing, you know, drive efficiency, insight, growth for the companies, kind of take a much more active role or have the ability in the tool set to take a much more active role, which echoes a topic that's come up a few times in recent months on the show as we've talked with a few different CFOs about the kind of changing role of the CFO. And really it's come up not with CFOs, just with CFOs, but with CTOs, with kind of across C-suite positions that the roles of different C-suite positions have changed a lot in, uh, you know, over really the last couple of decades, but it's really accelerated like a lot of things in the last half decade to decade or so of, you know, much more driving of business decision-making coming from each portion of the company rather than we all kind of report to the CEO that makes most of these decisions that drives most of the change. And the CFO position is one that's been kind of chief among those. And again, we've talked about it with multiple recent CFOs on the show about the, you know, my, in my career, my role has dramatically changed for the better. They have both thought or for the more interesting mm-hmm. to them, they both thought, would you agree that that, you know, shift has taken place and how have you kind of seen within your career, the role of a CFO or the role of the like lead financial team change within a big uh, enterprise level company. Absolutely, I, I fully, fully agree. I think with 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 that statement, you know, and and I think that all executives 
have benefited from the, the broad technological shift and advancements that have been taking place over, over decades, as you mentioned, and, and more so, of course, in, in more recent years. I think they've been able to, to more easily take care of manual, of course, repetitive tasks, such as simply getting informed as to what really happened with their part of the business and shift a lot of their focus to, as you mentioned, decision making. And in a broader sense, being a true strategic value-add partner to the CEO. And of course, I'm, I'm sure CEOs have benefited from that as well, because that is uh, how you get leverage and how you're able to uh, to do even more, right? And I think for CFOs specifically, that's absolutely right. I think they've uh, they've benefited from this in an, in an outsized way. I think that, that their transition has actually been even greater. You know, historically, CFOs, of course, have been always the ones who've had to uh, key talk of the business's performance. They were uh, essentially the, uh, the the holders of the truth in in a way. And um, I think many CFOs have been able to shift to actually being the the true strategic advisors that that many of them can be. And I th I also say I also think that's why we continue to see so many CFOs replace CEOs once once they depart. It is, I think, uh, still and even more so today, one of the most uh, probable likely candidates for uh, replacing a CEO and, and you continue to see that. And I think there's very, very good reason for that, especially with recent advancements that we've seen and uh, those that we will continue to see hopefully as well. Yeah, the holders of truth. That is really good. And I'm going to have to steal that from you in the future as well. That's uh, really fantastic and and lays it out so plainly, too. Of Yeah, the, the role, you know, used to be long ago, just like hand in the report. But that report literally had where they're the only person actually looking at the true facts of what is happening in the country or the company, what's coming in and out. And so it you know seems pretty obvious now in hindsight that the person who is you know, if you're giving that report to someone and saying, here, take these facts and make a decision based on it, it would seem like you would want to ask the person who's been pouring over and studying those facts and that that sheet and that data, uh, you know, the first person you'd want to ask their opinions of. So we've gotten to that place now. And we have throughout this conversation, you know, referenced date, the word data has come up quite a bit. Uh, one that has not come up that I'll kind of end on here. The final topic is AI, which is, you know, I've got to kind of ask everyone on the show about these days and especially those working so heavily in kind of data management and kind of getting everyone in sync across a financial team in your instance here. This was also a few months back, so bear with me as I kind of jog your memory mm -hmm. again, but you did a LinkedIn post where an AI tips post that was in conjunction with PwC, I think, about some ways to use AI effectively and kind of better evaluate AI providers now that there's starting to be you know, a plethora of options of who you could turn to for something like that. The one that stuck out was how AI is, bet is at its best when working with unstructured data. So... Could you define unstructured versus structured data for us and then explain kind of why dealing with unstructured data is one of AI's best use cases, in your opinion? Absolutely. So structured data, of course, uh, you know, references any data that that follows a very well structured or repetitive and kind of preset um, schema. And unstructured data is is one that does not. And I think one of the places that we're starting to see unstructured data be leveraged and utilized unbelievably effectively by by AI tools, you know, ChatGPT and, and the likes, um, actually has to do with its ability to sort of fill in the gaps and connect the dots. So by actually being able to pull from various unrelated, often real-time and up-to-date data sources, we're actually able to build a much more complete picture of whatever it is that you're now trying to solve or a, a prompt that you're trying to, to, to answer or fill. And so, you know, one example that comes to mind is, let's say uh, you need to make a connection between uh, a business's old and new name. That is something that is actually quite easy for AI tools to do, again, given the, the connectivity that they have to a very broad set of data sources. And this task, although it's it really is a pretty minor one, 
but actually a, a fairly common one, which can bring a business down to, to a halt. If you don't have that ability to, to make that connection, I think is, is a pretty good example uh, of a day-to-day -day challenge that probably uh, teams have dealt with in the past and now is something that, that should be easily solved. But again, there, there are many, many examples and I'm actually pretty excited about um, both additional use cases that we've seen to date and ones that of course will come up in the future. And of course we as well leverage AI and uh, across different parts of the product to, to categorize transactions, for example, to help with modeling and projecting various things into the future as well. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Well, Tal, this has been a real pleasure. For those listening who may want to learn more about Ledge or may want to get in touch with you, keep up with everything you and the company have going on, where would be the best place for them to go to find you? So I think a website, which is ledge.co, ledge.co is, is, is a great place, uh, or LinkedIn, a company profile as well and uh yeah would love to 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 be uh to to connect with really any of the any of the listeners or viewers wonderful we'll link, about to those. we'll link to those and more in the show notes below tal thank you so much for your time and knowledge today i've greatly enjoyed it and hope to speak again sometime soon absolutely thank you so much for having me jacob really enjoy the conversation mm -hmm.